Um, ladies and gentlemen, today I want to have a pleasant time with you by showing you how to model a linear programming model. So in order to begin anything, I want us to go back to the Family Ghana Limited that we originally have. I want to write a mathematical model. We want to solve this model as if we didn't know the answer before. And this was a model. Just to recap, it was Zmax equal to 40x1 plus 50x2. Okay, this was a model that we had. And this was subject to two constraints. One was a labor constraint, which was 1x1 is x1, but let's say 1x1 for a reason, plus 2x2 less or equal to 40 hours of labor. And then 4x1 plus 3x2 less or equal to 120 gallons of milk. Then we had a non-negativity constraint, which was x1, x2 greater or equal to zero. I'm sure you all remember. If you remember, type the letter yes or y so that I know you are with me. <clears throat> now, how do we solve this in Excel? Well, the first thing you want to do in solving this in Excel, and, and, and again, some of you will not type yes. So I want you to be participatory. Okay, it will help you yourself. And I want you all who can and should have your laptop open. Have your laptop open and model alongside me. Okay, model it alongside myself. At the end of the day, I'm going to ask some of you to show me what you have, and then I will reward you. So how do we model this? Well, the first thing you want to do is to write the name of the company in the cell A1. Okay. So let me just zoom a little bit, then you can see the cell. So this is cell A1. Write the name of the company, which is Fama Ghana Limited. So I just write it there, Fama Ghana Limited. The next thing you do is to write the names of the decision variables. The first one was you find Yogo, let's make it short Yogo. The second one was find Choco, let's make it short Choco. In the order in which, you, if there was Fan Ice, Fandango, Tampico, they will keep going to the right, to the right, to the right, to the right. So that's the first thing. Who is thoroughly convinced or who is thoroughly confused? So let's go to Matilda. Matilda, your hand is up. So please, we can't see your, what you are writing. You can't see the Excel? No, please. Wow. Mimi, you can't see the Excel? Mimi, are you there? I want to be sure. I want to be sure that you all can see. Can Can you all tell me? Can one or two people tell me whether you see or you cannot see? Because I've been talking. So does it mean that all that I wrote you couldn't see the Z Max thing? You couldn't see the Z Max, Esther. You cannot see. You can only see the L. Esther, your voice is far away. Can see the um the slide. But not the extra work. And unless we are allowed to talk, we cannot unmute either. Of course, of course. I deliberately did that because all of you are standing me behind the scenes. If you want to talk, you raise your hand. That was a good thing. You see? Yeah, so, the the noises will be coming into the recording, and I don't like that. So if you want to talk, you raise your hand. I will unmute you. You will do the talk. All right. So let me, let me show the screen again. Okay. If you can't see, let me show the screen again. Hmm. So let me know if you can see the Excel. I'm sure you should be able to see the Excel now. You see the Excel, you can type yes, Excel or no Excel. That will give me the clue. Yes, Excel, yes, Excel, fantastic. Okay, wow. Then I need to write the model again because I'm positive that you didn't see the model. So let me write the model again. This is the model. It was, and you all have it already. I'm just rewriting it. Okay. 
classic. Mm. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a shame. The model is not showing here because I've gone into a new mode. But just as a way to remind you, this was the model. Okay. It was Z max. Okay. And it was equal to 40x1 okay, plus 50x2. This was a model. And then we said it was subject to S dot. And then we had 1x1 or x1 okay, plus 2x2 or x2. And then we had less than or equal to and 40. This was the model we had. Okay. Then the second part was 4x1 okay, plus 3x2 less than or equal to 120. So this was a model. And then we had a non-negativity constraint as x1 comma x2 comma, greater or equal to zero. If you don't get it, you raise your hand and then I'll explain better. However, this was the model we had. And I'm sure you all remember it now. This was the model. So what we have is a mathematical model and what we are going to do is to put it into Excel so that Excel can give us the results. We have only two decision variables, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because whether the decision variables are 200 or two, you are gonna be easily be able to solve it in Excel. So how do we solve it in Excel? The first thing you do is to write the name of the company, which you see on the top left there, top, top left there. Okay, so that's what you see. Then you write the name of the decision variable, which is fine, you go, I wrote just you go. Then you write the name of the choco, which is a second decision variable which is fine check. The next thing to do is to write, give a heading called decision variables. The DV is a decision variable. What is that? And like I said, you can have your Excel and be typing what I'm typing right here. Come on, come on, come on. Some of you should do that. Okay. I don't expect all of you to do that. However, I expect some of you to do that. I want the cream de la creme, the alphas and the omegas, the mumuchu mumuchi, the kuchangas and the kuchangas, the, the, the head and not the tail, the catapurios, the mambo jumbos. Okay? You are the ones who I'm going to be with you throughout this modeling process. Okay? But of course, some of you will choose and say, I can't do it. Okay? For such one of you, it means that you will not be able to follow me practically. You will only follow me theoretically. However, those that are going to be doing the extra with me, man, I'm going to reward you. So let's keep going. So you have the name of the company, Pamagana Limited, the decision variable, the name of the other decision variable, then the Z value. Let me put that one here. Okay, Z value. That is the objective function value. Okay, let's put it. And then below the name of the company, you write the decision variable, a letter to indicate the decision variable. Okay. A letter to make this here. Mimi says I should make her a co-host again. All right, Mimi, I've done that. So what you now do is you now write the name of the so you see when you are modeling us at the beginning we don't know the value of the decision variable so this section here which is the value the actual value of the decision variable because we don't know the decision variable we initialize the value to zero and so we write zero the same way we don't know the choco which is a the, the value of the decision variable choco. We don't know. So we initialize the value to zero. You type it there. Okay. The next thing is to write below the DV, the decision variable coefficient. 
coefficient. Who can tell me what the coefficient means? Raise your hand and tell me. Coefficient. What does the coefficient stand for? What does the coefficient stand for? Raise your hand. What does the coefficient stand for? Or you can type it. The coefficient. Okay, we've got a winner. Daniel, Daniel, Daniel is right here with me. What does the coefficient stand for, Daniel? Doc, it stands for the number, which is the constant that is attached to the variable, either x1 or x2. Yeah, but what you mentioned mathematically, what does it mean? It's still a mathematical thing. But what does it mean? Who can tell us? What does the coefficient mean? When you say it's a constant, it doesn't. But what does it mean? What is it doing? It's not a constraint, Esther. It's not a constraint. What does it mean? Come on, guys. Come on. What does it mean? Hmm? Oh, check. Oh, Philip. Philip. Philip, give us something. Okay. What does it I've mean? Said the, the coefficient represents the profits per unit. Good. Exactly. It represents the per unit profit for each decision variable. It is a price. It's a profit you are getting for actually, you know, buying or producing a single fan yoga or a single fan choco. Fantastic. All right. Now, currently, what is the value for the yoga coefficient? It's 40. So you write it there. What is the coefficient for choco? It's 50. And you see, once you are modeling, your eye must be looking on the right here. You can see 40 and 50. They are right here. So that's what you are actually fitting in. You are fitting those things right there. Okay. All right. Now, we need to now find the Z value. And look at the formula here. The Z value stands for what? If you look carefully then, look carefully. The Z value says that we should multiply something with something with something. That's what it says. Okay. So, so we got to multiply the 40 by the X1. But right now, look at it, the 40 by the X1. We don't know the value of X1, so we represented the X1 by zero. So how do you write the C variable? It's an equation. Look at it, it's an equation. So you got to write it as an equation. We're going to put it directly below this. That's what we're going to do. We're going to put it directly below, under the Z section. So you bring it equal to symbol first, because it's an equation. Mm -hmm. Then you take the 40. Look at the formula on the right side here, in yellow. You take the 40, so I'll select the 40 here, and boom, it will take B3. What is a more what is a 40 doing with the X1? It is multiplying. So you bring your times. Okay. And then you will select the zero, which is the X1 for the yoga. However, the moment you select that, you need to do something magically. And that is because the decision variable is going to be appearing in other situations. It's going to happen in other areas because we are going to use that decision variable. Look at it. Look at the constraint. It also has X1 and X2. Look at the next constraint. It also has X1 and X2. Okay. So because this X1, which we don't know the current value yet, because it's going to be appearing all the time, we can make a magical introduction of the dollar symbol that will automatically multiply them when the need ever arises. How do you do that? You press the FN key down and press the F4 key. Sometimes, depending on some computers, you only press the F4 key. Now, right now, if I press the F4 key, nothing happens. Okay, so I need to press the FN key. Okay, and that is the name. Guys, write it down. Press the FN key. So I press the FN key, then I press F4. Watch what happens. You need to first select the decision variable. So I'm going to select the decision variable here. I have, it's now B2. Then press the FN, F4. Watch what happens. A dollar symbol comes before the B and after the B. A dollar symbol comes before the B and after the B. But of course, we are still taking the B. Once you are done with that, you press the plus because the formula says plus 50, X2. So let's go to the 50, select the 50, and then 50 is multiplying the X2. So you bring the times, 
and then you go and select the x2, which is now zero, and that becomes c2. And then, because that is going to be a changing variable, you press the fn and then f4 key again. There will be a dollar before and after the c. Watch it. There will be a dollar before and after the c. And so this is the formula. Okay. So Excel has taken all of the formula in a nice way. Once you are done, you click enter. The formula is currently zero because again, the decision variables are initially zero. Fantastic. You are done with the first part of the model, which is the objective function. Now we go to the constraints. So we'll give it a title and call it constraints. Constraints, okay. And then below the constraint, write the name of the first constraint, which is labor constraint. So type labor. Write the name of the second constraint, which is no constraint. So type milk. Very good. And now look at the formula for the constraint on the right hand side. There is a symbol which is a sign. Okay. And watch the constraint carefully. It is split into three parts. The first part is the usage at the left hand side. The second part is the available. Sorry, the second part is a symbol. And then after the symbol, you have the available. Okay, so I'm gonna give some names. Let's call this first part here, the whole of this first part. I'm gonna put all of them together because remember it's a formula, one, one x one plus two x two. And that formula should be directly below the Z column. And you will understand why very soon. So you write here, usage, usage. And then on the right, you write symbol or sign. And then on the far end, you write available. Available. Fantastic. Okay. So guys, watch it something. Why did I put it directly below the Z? Because watch it, the Z is multiplying. The Z is a formula obtained from X something times X1 plus something times X2. Now, when you look at the usage too, we have something times x1 plus something times x2. The other constraint, we have something times x1, something times x2. So that is why I'm putting all of them under the column Z. Column Z. Okay. But let's do the easier ones first. The sign. So let's write the sign. It is less than or equal to. So you just use your... This is just for cosmetic purposes, just for beautification. You write a sign less than and then equal to. And then you can drag it to fulfill the other one. Okay. Because they all have the less than or equal to. Then you go to the right hand side. The right hand side, as you can see in the formula, it is 40 and then 120. You just type it as it is. 40 and then 120, just as it is. Okay. You're done. Let's go to the main thing, which is a usage. Now, the usage is a formula which is only obtainable if you have the numbers written. So look at the first constraint. The first number is one. The second number is two. Then the second constraint. The first number is four. The second number is three. So you go here. And then you type, first constraint is one. So you type one. You go to the right. Second, um, the second part of the labor constraint is two. So you type two. So you go to the one under the yoga, which is the X1. The coefficient there is four, so you type four. Then under the choco, the coefficient there is three, so you type three. Then under the usage, that is when you are combining all of them. You are combining everything. But you see, that can be taken from here because this formula is already taken. When you copy this formula for the Z, Okay, watch it. Let me take the formula here. I'm going to highlight it yellow so that you can appreciate it more. When you go for this formula here, okay, you can just take that formula and dump it into the labor usage and the milk usage. It will take the values nicely. I have copied it, click it, paste it here, and drag it to collect it also into the milk. When you touch the bottom section, okay, I have to do this again because you might not know. It becomes plus, the cursor becomes plus. Once it becomes plus, you click and drag it down 
the formula is taken. So what is actually inside this first formula? Watch it. I'm going to double click it. Once I double click it, you can see that it is picking the numbers, the coefficient for labor, and multiplying them with the zeros, which is a decision variable. Why? Because I've already commanded Excel with this dollar symbol, this dollar before and after the second part of the formula. So because I've done that, anytime you copy this thing and you dump it into this section under labor or milk, it will be automatically multiplying the decision variables here. And that is what the dollar symbol is meant for. You are done. What we just did is known as modeling in Excel. Ophelia, are you with me? Did any of you move along with me? Are you dancing with me? Or you are watching alone? Okay. Some of you have done that. And the evidence to prove that you've done this along with me, yeah, yeah, is that we are going to solve it. And may the good God be with you as we now solve it. The most difficult part of linear programming is formulating the model, formulating the model. That's what we've done. As for solving it, Excel will do the rest for you. Fantastic. Some of you are saying that you've done it. So let's go to the solving. I've already indicated that you guys should install your solver. So you've done that already. So you click on the data tab, data tab, data tab, data tab, data tab, data tab, okay? I've just clicked on that. And then when you click on the data tab on the far right, you see solver there. You see solver, far right, you see solver. If you don't see solver, raise your hand. That is if you are with me. If you have already been modeling with me, okay, you should see solver. If you don't see solver, what it means is that you didn't go through the video my TA put it there to go and install the solver. So I would, I would suggest that you do that now. Okay. Now, when you say you have issues with the F and F4 key, you've said nothing. You have to be specific. Okay. What issues are you having with the F and F of P specific? Then it will be addressed for you. Because by, by you saying that you have issues, you can even say you have issues with the whole formulation. Okay, so you gotta be specific. Now, for those of you who have clicked on the data tab, okay, click on the solver, solver. A pop-up will come. This pop-up is known as a solver parameter dialog box. That's what it means, solver parameter dialog box. Note it, the first thing in the solver parameter dialog box is called set objective. Set objective means your Z value, the objective function value. Right now, it is six. It is D6 inside, okay? But you have to delete it and go and collect it yourself because sometimes it could be a misleading cell. So let's go to our, well, where is the objective function value? That is it. That is the one in the yellow section here. So whilst the whole objective set is empty, click zero. And you see that it is D3. The next thing, ask yourself, are we doing maximization or minimization? It's maximization, so you select max. It is a default. If you are doing minimization, you select minimize. Okay. If you have a different value you are dealing with, you can set it up. Now is maximization, so let's go with max. The next thing is by changing variable cells. By changing variable cells simply refers to the decision variables. Note it down. These are all IA questions, okay? By changing variable cells in Excel is the equivalent of the decision variables, okay? Now, so once you click there, you have to now go and indicate which ones are the decision variables. They are zero and zero here. So you select them pack into the by changing variable cell. And you can see that they have been collected there, B2 colon C2. You are done. Now we go to the constraint. So you click the big white space under the subject to the constraint. You should click it so that the, the glass, that designated glass is showing. Now we are going to add the constraint. Remembering the symbols, the sign, in our case, all the constraints have got left less than or equal to sign. 
And sometimes you can have some of them having less than or equal to sign or greater than sign. Okay. You have less than or equal to sign or greater than or equal to or even equal to. Whichever one it is, you know, it will help you. Now, when you say you press the Fn and F4 key, but nothing shows, it is probably because you are not even in the cell. Okay. You, you see, it must go along with what you are typing. So you must have selected the coefficient, which is 40, and then must have clicked the times, which is a star, then must have selected the zero, which is the B2, before you press the Fn key down, hold it, and then press the F4. Now you don't go and press Fn, forget, and then go and press F4, no. You gotta hold the Fn key down before you press the F4. That is how it works. Okay. Now, once, so you click the subject to constraint here and click add, add, add. Okay, once you click add, a pop-up will come. And that pop-up is known as a constraint parameter dialog box. This is it. Constraint parameter dialog box. It has a left side and it has a right side. It has a left side and a right side. Esther, yes. Yes, sir. Please, um, I'm lost. Hello, sir. You know that doesn't help me or help you. Or help um, you. Yes, sir. Lost, right? the, when you open the solver um, box, the parameters, I think I lost you along the line. I couldn't hear you all. So, um, when you go to the place where you change the variable um, cells by changing variable cells, I got a bit lost. Okay, let me go back there. Please come, in, come. In. Thank you. By changing variables, I don't mute yourself because you come back again and say you didn't understand. So stay there. By changing variable cells, all I said is that it's empty. Right? Once it's empty, all you do is go and select the zero and zero, the cells. You okay. click and drag it, and it will be collected inside there by changing variable cells. Okay. But I don't have to wait for you to do it before I continue. I just want yes, you to know that that's what you will do. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Now you go to the subject to constraint, you click add, and then the pop-up that will come is a constraint dialog box. It has the left side, it has the symbol, and it has the right side. The left yeah. side is the same as the usage, but they call it cell reference. The right okay. side is the same as the um, available, but Excel calls it constraint. So let's look for the left side. The left side, the values there are all zero, zero. And they all have the same symbol. So you can select one and drag it down. And they will all be collected into the cell reference, which is the left-hand side. So I click on the first zero, I drag it down, and then it is collected here. That is D5 to D6. Then I choose the symbol. That regard. The symbol there is less than or equal to. Um, Matilda. The symbol is less than or equal to. Yes, Matilda. Yes, Matilda. No, you raised your hand twice. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so you take the sign and the sign is less than or equal to, so it's already the default, so you leave that one. And then click on the constraint. The constraint refers to the available and they all work with the less than or equal to sign. So you can click the 40 into the constraint and drag it to the 120, also into the constraint. 
So you've done the two. If one of them or some of them do not have the less than or equal to symbol, okay, then what you are going to do is you are going to click add a new empty cell reference and constraint reference will show. And then you have to indicate that and change the symbol. Remember the symbols include less than or equal to, equal to greater than integer binary or difference in difference. See, this integer and binary will come and lend them. So when, when you want to impose integrality constraint, okay, or binary constraint, you can now select any of these. But for now, they are all less than or equal to. And once you are completed, you click OK. If you are not completed, but you have to do one for greater than or equal to, then you click out until you finish with all of them before you do OK. Now we are done with all of them, so click OK. And then once you click OK, you are taken back to the solver parameter dialog box. Now, where is a non-negativity constraint? That is the next thing here. So you see a check symbol that says make unconstrained variables non-negative. That is a non-negative variable. If it is not checked, check it. The default is that it is checked. So we are done with that. So the non-negativity constraint is implicit. The next thing is to select the solving method. And the solving method Excel uses is the, for this linear programming is the, is the simplex algorithm, the simplex linear programming. So you select the simplex LP and that's it. You're gonna click solve, watch something that happens. Once you click solve, a, a solver result will pop out. Your interest is in the sensitivity. So let's click on sensitivity, sensitivity. Click on that and click okay, okay. Click on that and click okay. And you can keep the solutions so you can restore the original values. I want to restore the original values because your interest is a sensitivity report. I'm going to click okay and watch down here, a new sheet will be created. A new sheet will be created called the sensitivity report one. Let's do that. And there you go. A new sheet has just been created known as a sensitivity report one. Let me click on that sheet. And that is the most important thing you need today. Okay. At this stage, this sensitivity report, we are gonna answer 13 questions from that. So please pay attention. 13 questions. Okay, so whichever first question I give you, you write it down. Second, you write it down. Third, you write it down. Then we solve it, you write, you solve it, you write, you solve it. It's going to be a bit faster. So move along with me. And if you have a question, quickly raise your hand and let's handle it. Okay. If, if I allow on mute, okay, I'm going to now allow you, you just watch what's going to happen. I'm going to allow you to mute and unmute yourself. And some will be disturbing. You watch. Okay. And I pray that I'm wrong so that it doesn't disturb others. I think some don't check their things. They've left their phones and, and laptops somewhere and their family members are just pressing, pressing them. So I'm going to do that and then I hope that will not get disturbances here. So that if you have, even if you still have a question, please raise your hand so that I can address it. All right, so this is a sensitivity report, Pamela, right? Um, okay, sir. So if you can go to sheet one and then maybe I want to see the formula for um the coefficient. That's the coefficient where you have to bring the dollar sign. I did it last week, but when I was following you, I missed you along the way. So my sensitivity report is there, but it's wrong. So if you can click on your zero, I want to see. Three, three. Three, three, star, one, two. Two plus C three. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. So we go to the sensitivity report, and here is a first question. Now let me just tell you that in an exam situation, you will not exam, you will not be told to model the whole thing in Excel. No. 
you will be told to model the thing mathematically and put it down like we did mathematically here. But you will be given the Excel result like it is here. You will be given the sensitivity report and then you will answer several questions around that. And that is what I'm going to do with you. So please pay attention. So the first question is this. The question is from the sensitivity report. That's a question. From the sensitivity report, what is the optimal solution to the farm mill Ghana Limited problem? From the sensitivity report, what is the optimal solution to the farm mill Ghana Limited problem? So who can answer this question for us? Who can raise our Jennifer? Okay. Um Doug, please, where we have the final value under the variable cells. Mm -hmm. It has done what? Um, where we have final value for 24 for yogo and then 8 for choco. Uh -huh. It has done what? Those are the optimum um, quantities. Okay. Those are the optimal values. Okay. Now, who can tell me another way this question could have been asked? without mentioning the word optimal values. Who can tell me another way? Um, Jennifer, lower your hands. Always, when you're done, lower your hands. So this is what the question could be, that how many sachets of fine yogurt and choco should farm organic limited produce? But you should know that it's not always you're going to have how many blah, blah, blah should you produce. Sometimes the question will be, what is your optimal solution? And the word optimal solution simply refers to the final value of the variable Kill cell. Dying. I dem, I dem. See what I told you? Uh, it refers to the final value of the variable cells. You see what I told you? I could. I keep telling people that there are some people, they just don't listen. They, they are like that. Their life is not to listen. And then they will say sorry, even though they know that they are not listening still. They still say sorry. All right, so that is the final value of the variable cell. And the next question is this. What is the corresponding value of the objective function? So the first one, the answer is 24 sachet of fine yogo and then eight sachet of fine choco. That is the answer to that question. The next one, what is the corresponding value of the objective function? So the question is asking you that based on the answer you had before, what is the corresponding value of the objective function? Who can tell me how to do that? Not the answer. Tell me how to get the answer. What is the corresponding value of the objective function? Nathaniel. Okay, so uh, we know that our, uh, our Z mass is 40x1 plus uh, 50x2. So for we to uh, get uh, the corresponding value. I think we are going to multiply the final value. The, the final value for final value. Uh, you multiply the final value for final value by its corresponding objective coefficient. So here I'll get 24 times 40, which will give me nine, 960. When I'm done, I'll multiply the final value of final value with its corresponding uh, objective coefficient. So that one too, if I do, I'll get 400. So at the end of the day, I'll get a total value of 1,360. Fantastic. I like the way you did it. Okay. So for those of you who are not getting, we are talking about the Z value. And the Z value should be the final value okay, multiplied by the objective coefficient. That's it. Plus the next final value okay, multiplied by the next objective coefficient. 
And when you do that, that will give you the corresponding value of the objective function. That will give you the So in our case, it's going to be 24 multiplied by 4 plus 8 multiplied by 50. That is it. That is how you got to attack this very question. Now, let's go to the next one. Next question. Question three. What is the reduced cost value? Write it down. What is the reduced cost value? So now we want to explain what the reduced cost value is before we apply it to this Excel. Of course, if you are here, you will notice that there's a column called reduced cost. Now, what does the word reduced cost here mean? That's all we are talking about. I'm not asking you what is the value of the reduced cost, no. That one we can all see that the value is zero, zero. Now, what is it? What is this reduced cost value? What does this stand for in terms of this modeling process, in terms of this Pharma Gamma Limited? You know, what, what, what does it mean? What does it mean? What to what one can be? One can be okay? Michael Boateng. All right, sir. So I'm thinking that the reduced cost value is the slack of that particular corresponding um product they are producing. So the reduced cost is the there's it means there's no reduce, there's no slack in producing fine yogurt at 24 units, and also there's no slack in producing choco at eight units. Okay. Well, that is not really the case. So let's go to another person, Frank Lena. Doc, I think because the final value is given the total um, sachets produced and then the reduced value is showing zero. I'm thinking the reduced value is at the point at which there's no production of um, any sachet of fan you go to. Okay, that is not really the answer at all. Let's go to Bright. Uh, Prof, uh, I think the reduced cost value, the reduced cost value is the opportunity cost of producing 24 Sachi of yogo and then a sachi of choco. That is fine. Excellent. What do you mean by that? Uh, what I mean by that is that uh, because we are able to produce uh, the 24 sachi of yogo and then the eight sachi of choco, uh, we have used all our resources and then we have not incurred any cost in producing these optimal values? Well, that part where you say we have used all our resources, that part there is a little bit fishy. That second part that you said, it means that, what did you say? So uh, what I'm trying to say sir, is that uh, because we are able to produce the 24 sachets- It's not necessarily because we are able to produce. Okay. That's what I wanted to say. It's not necessary because we are able to produce all the 24. Because you are making it look like the reduced cost is only spoken of when we are able to produce, which is not really the case, which is not the case at all. Teresa. Teresa. Sorry, it was, sorry, sorry, it was just a mistake. Okay, Nathaniel. Teresa, you see, I saw you and you said it was just a mistake. So I thought that you would lower your hand right after. And yet your hand is still so, okay. And Nathaniel. So say, please, uh, the reduced cost of zero means that uh, that is the opportunity cost of producing a uh, uh, fine yogo. So in, the, in this case, the reduced cost zero means uh, there no, is no cost we are going to incur in the production. No, 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 no. Nathani, I didn't ask you what the reduced cost of zero means. I was only asking you what is the meaning of a reduced cost. Uh, not, not because of it. Remember, please note this down, write it down. The reduced cost value can be positive, it can be negative, it can be zero. So the use cost value can be positive or negative or can be zero. And I, I always ask this question. So it's very important to understand that. Okay. 
can be positive or negative or zero. When is it positive? In a maximization. No, in a minimization. When is it positive? In a minimization. When is it negative? In a maximization. When is it zero? We are coming to that. So all of you use the word, it is opportunity cost, but I, I wanted the others to understand because again, opportunity cost is like an economic term. Unless you can define the opportunity cost clearly, somebody doesn't understand. What is opportunity cost? And don't give me Google definition. What do we mean by the opportunity cost? And give me a practical example of an opportunity cost. What, what is an opportunity cost? That, not. Frederick. Frederick, go ahead. All right, Miriam. Um, <clears throat> so, um, opportunity cost um, is the cost for gone, for, um, for choosing one alternative over the other. An example is, I work in the construction industry, and sometimes when we want to pour concrete, we can decide to either go from the suppliers who supply pre-mix or use manual labor. So there are analysis where we make to determine whether to go with, with um But on the other hand, sometimes when you use manual labor, it's cheaper. So the decision on whether to go with manual labor or going to the supplier, when that decision is made, I believe that's when opportunity cost comes in. Very good. I like that. And I like the example you've just given. So the opportunity cost in economics, they define it as the next best alternative for God. If I should produce fan yoga, what will I lose? It, it has nothing to do with the resources. I mean, what will I lose? In monetary terms, what will I lose? That's a reduced cost value here. If I go ahead and produce the fan yoga, all right, I am producing the fan yoga. You see the word I'm using? I'm producing the fan yoga. I did not say I am producing 24 units of fan yoga. No, I am producing it. The number of the quantities I'm producing is not relevant here. I'm producing it. And as long as I'm producing that product, what is the next best alternative that I am losing? And the reason why we say you are losing that is because Possibly the resources that you were using to the production of the fan yoga, those resources are no longer available for the production of that alternative. So you being in the class right now, right this time, there is an opportunity cost of being in this class of right now. Who can give me two of them? Who can give me two of the opportunity costs of sitting here right now watching your computer screen, not your phone screen, watching your computer screen, modeling along with me, writing things down. What is the opportunity cause of all that? Matt? It's time. Sorry? Time, time. No. What is opportunity? I mean, you've just spoken with that, but we are still using time here. Raymond. Please attending funeral or wedding. Exactly. Attending funeral or what? Wedding. Wedding. Okay. Yesterday, when we did a Friday, when somebody said, missing your Friday night. <laughs> you know, that, that live band Friday night that you miss. Okay. So that was opportunity cost. And that is for gone. 
As for the time, you're using the time in book. So, so exactly, Esther, you have to forget that. So that is the point, the events that you should have attended today. Some people had weddings and parties today. You got to forget that. That's opportunity cost. Now, what's this value of zero for the reduced cost here? What does it then stand for? The value of zero, what does it then mean? Why does the reduced cost column here contain zero? What is the implication? Why does it contain zeros? What is the implication of the reduced cost values being zero? What is the implication? What does that mean? What is the principle behind that? Yes, Nat. Yes, yeah, sir. So uh, the reduced cost of zero zero means that we are producing fungible and fungible uh, at no opportunity cost. Don't use the word opportunity cost again, because I think that you are using some words that looks like you've memorized them. I want you to explain this whole thing to a six-year-old child. That means you've got to use your own words to make it easier. You see, that is when we know, Einstein will say that you are smart. If you can explain it to a seven-year-old child. Let's go to Michael. Michael, okay, look, it means. Uh, hello. Right, right. Yes. What is so the a reduced cost of zero means that um, we are not there's no uh, we are not foregoing any alternative in producing the twenty four unit of fine yogurt. Okay. In other words. Simple language. In other words, let's go to Philip. Maybe you crack it. Philip, yes. In other words. And say, in other words, the reduced cost value tells you. Why are you, you the, repeating the word reduced cost value again? Okay, the reduced cost. Well, I said you're repeating, you're repeating again. Okay, so it, uh -huh. it tells you the sacrifice you have made for undertaking okay. the you. final decision. Doesn't mean that you should go and give me a synonym for you know those words. Okay, I mean, let's explain it to a six-year-old. In other words, someone. Someone. Yes, dog. Yes, dog. Go ahead, go ahead. So in my understanding, yes, in my understanding, I believe that the resources are available for the production of you Sorry, Samuel, we are losing you. Your, your microphone has been used efficiently. All right. Okay. Okay. I know we didn't hear much of what you were saying. Let's go to Hello, the Dominic. Thank you, Samuel. Esther. So, in other words, we have produced both the fan and the fan choco. Hmm? I, in hear other words, have, I was saying that in other words, uh, the zero means that we have produced both the yogo and the fan yogo. Okay. What you said, I don't even understand. Somebody made a very, you know, like sacrifice or alternative. And I said, what does that mean? Okay. So guys, in other words, we lose nothing producing fan yogo. We lose nothing. Of producing fungible, so that we make that. That is what a seven-year-old child is going to understand. We lose nothing. Okay, if you give a, a chocolate to this person and you give ice cream to the other person, and then the other person, I want the ice cream, I don't want the chocolate. You lose nothing. The child get, gets it, so you lose nothing. So go ahead and produce what you are producing. What does it mean when the reduced cost value now is negative? What does it mean when the reduced cost value, let's assume that reduced cost value is negative five. Now, when can it be negative five? Let's generate a picking model. Okay, let me go and change the value of the 50 to 90. Okay, changing the value of the Choco 50 to 90. I'm running the model quickly again, and then I'm creating a second sensitivity report. Okay, 
let's see what that sensitivity report will give us. Okay, so this is another sensitivity report. And you get sensitivity report two. So watch it. Now the situation has changed in this model. You can see that the reduced cost value is negative five. What does this negative five mean? Who can tell me? What does this value mean? Right. Prof, uh, what it means is that if, if we decided to produce uh, uh, um, zero unit of fan yoko, we would have incurred a five CD or dollar more cost to uh, pr produce that. In other words, if you want to produce 20 units of fan choco, this would be the cost we would have incurred if we decided to produce zero units of fan yoko. It's confusing. It makes a lot of things. It's got nothing to do with the other one anyway. Let's go to someone. Oh, you're going to say the same thing. Okay. All right. So, so guys, what, what this is implying is that the negative five means that you will lose. Right now, as it stands, you are supposed to produce fan yoga of zero. In other words, as it stands, you don't have to produce fan yoga. If you force yourself, if you force yourself and produce fan yoga, you will incur a cost. You will incur a loss. You will incur a damage. And that damage is the negative 12, negative 5. So what this is telling you is that don't produce fan yoga because this is the punishment you will get for producing fan yoga. You will lose this amount. But then you can produce fan yoga provided that we are able to do something. Now, what is the price of fan yoga? Currently, the price of fan yoga is 40. Oh, sorry, the profit of fan yoga, the per unit profit of fan yoga is 40. That is why he's telling you you shouldn't produce. Because the profit you are going to get if you should produce the fan yoga is that you won't get enough profit if you should go. So the only thing that will motivate the producer to produce a fan yoga is for you to increase the per unit profit. So if we move the 45 upward to, sorry, 40 to 45, then it, this value here becomes producible. I can prove that to you, okay? And how do you know that? Because you have something called allowable increase. I'll come back to that. The allowable increase tells you by how much you can increase the objective coefficient. And the maximum allowable increase is by five. So you add a five to the 45. So it means that if you want to produce when you go, then its profitability, its per unit profitability must be 45. So right now, the producer is supposed not to produce when you go. But it can be incentivized to produce it by increasing the price, or in this case, a profit to 45. If I go and change the value of to 45, if I go here, this right now, right here, and change this one to 45, okay? I'm not supposed to, but let me change it to 45 and run the model again. Watch what happens. It's no longer going to be zero because now you have incentivized the manager to produce the thing, okay? So you go to sensitivity report and click okay here. Let's watch the sensitivity report three. Uh, even that guy is not, it's, it's marginal. So normally it's good to go a little bit above because 45 is the limit. Okay, so let's keep it at 46. 46 means that you've gone a little bit, you know, above. At 45 means that it's within the sensitivity range. So let's do 46 and then run the thing again. So we're going to check sensitivity report four. I'm just showing you what we call scenario analysis. We'll do that properly next time. So in this scenario, if you click solve, okay, and you go to the sensitivity, let's call sensitivity report four, this is what happens. You can see that now the value is producible, okay? So now we are not incurring any cost simply by moving one step up, just from 45 to 46, because you have reached a point that is sensible for the producer. 
Let's go back to the original. This is our original sensitivity report. So the question now is that the reduced cost tells you whether or not you should produce or not to produce, simple. And I hope that some of these things we are saying, you are writing them down because it is understanding. It's not copy the better. Whether or not you should produce or not to produce. Okay, that is it for the reduced cost. Okay. Let's go to the next thing, unless you have a question. The next thing, and like I said, the reduced cost can be positive or it can be negative. So, so the question I ask, why does the reduced cost contain zeros? It contains zeros because Yogo and Choco were producible. Okay. As long as you are producing them, you are making them visible, realizable, then their reduced cost will be zero because it means that there is no damage there's no loss to the production by any time it is negative it means you don't have to produce in a maximization if it is positive it means that you don't have to you know produce them in a minimization all right next question what does it mean when we say constraints are binding what does it mean when we say constraints are binding, we are coming to the constraint here. When we say a binding constraint, what does it mean? Those of you who have read, those of you who are following, what does it mean when we say constraints are binding? Come on. So, um, it means that there are no slacks. Good. When Next constraints point, are binding, there are no slacks. Okay, so guys, write it down. It means that there are no slacks. That is the first point. Second. You can tell me the second point. Right. Uh, sir, it's when the right hand side is equal to the left hand side. Very good. When the left hand side equals the right hand side. Write it down. Three. You can tell me. Mm. Yes, Philip. Philip? Okay. I know what some of you are saying. When the usage equals to available, but that is the same as when the right hand side equals to the left hand side. Okay, but that's not really the most important one. Who can give me a better one? Sylvia. Sylvia. Yes, bro. Please, I was going to say the, the same thing what you just said that when the uh, usage okay. is equal so to. So that the is wrong. That is not really the one. It is when the shadow price is. Uh, Okay, let me mute everybody now. I think some people are just eardrummed. So when you want to talk, you raise your hand before I mute you. So um, when the shadow price is zero, I'll come back to the shadow price. Okay. That, so these are when constraints are binding. So using these principles, who can tell me which constraints are binding? Please write this reasons down. You will need them. Which constraints are binding? You can raise your hand and tell me. Raymond. Okay, let's go to Raymond. Yes, Raymond, which constraints are binding? Okay, thank you, Doc. Both labor and milk are binding. Why? Because the final value and and the right hand side of the con constraints are equal. Good. Good. So that is it. That's one of the reasons why that is so. All right. So keep note of that. Keep note of that. Okay. The next question. So when I say which constraints are not binding, you should also know about that. The next question. Let's go to the shadow price. What is the shadow price? That's the next question. What is the shadow price? Barbara, you have that. Um, so this is a question concerning the first one. You can I go ahead, please? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you said that constraints are 
binding when shadow price is zero. You mentioned three reasons where constraints to be binding. Does that mean that if one is so and the other two are not, it is still binding or all three have to be satisfied? Because when I look at our sensitivity what reports- all three? What do you mean by all three? You gave us three reasons. One, there's no slack. There Left hand side is the other. Pardon? There cannot be one against the other. All of them must follow this. Okay, but with the sensitivity reports in front of me right now, even though the final value and the constraint sites are equal, the shadow price is not equal to zero. So I'm a bit confused. Yes. Oh, the rule is when the shadow price is, is not zero, sorry. Oh, okay, okay. When the shadow that... price is non-zero. Okay. Non-zero. When the shadow price is positive or negative. There's a, there's a reason why I said non-zero than zero, than positive, okay? because it can be negative as well. Okay, yeah, that's a good, a good intervention so that nobody is confused. So when the shadow price is positive or negative, okay, non-zero. All right, the next question, what is the shadow price? What is the shadow price? Another name for the shadow price is called the dual value. Take note, the dual value. Guys, the compulsory question is always this topic we are doing. So it's, it's very important you're understanding at least some of it here, yeah, not all of it, at least some of it. What is the shadow price? You can see that situation here. What does it mean? Write this down. The shadow price tells you, the shadow price tells you, Frederick, what question do you have? Um, I want to describe the shadow price or explain the shadow price. Okay. So um, it is um, either a profit or a loss, um, we are going to incur in the constraints by either reducing or adding a unit to the constraints. Okay. That is incorrect. The set of price tells you by how much the Z value will change. The shadow price tells you by how much the Z value changes when the right hand side of the constraint changes by a unit. The shadow price tells you by how much the Z value changes. And the changes here can be coming rise or fall by how much the Z value changes when the right hand side of the constraint changes by a unit. You see, I didn't say a dollar, a gallon, an hour. I said a unit. So let me be deeper now. When you increase or decrease the available resources in this context here, Available resources are 40 gallons, 40 hours of labor, and 120 gallons of milk. If you should increase the hours of labor by one unit, how much the profit is going to increase here in this very example would depend on the value of the shadow price. If the shadow price is one, then if you increase the right-hand side of the constraint by one, profit is gonna increase by one times the shadow price. If you increase any of the available resources or the right-hand side of a constraint by any number, how that will affect how that is going to affect the 
profit would depend on the value of the shadow price. So if the shadow price is already zero, even if you increase the hours of labor by 10,000 hours, it shows that that's not going to help anything with profit because the shadow price is zero. So if we multiply the zero by the 10,000, it's zero. So profit is unaffected. So the shadow price, the word price here deals with value. That's why the name of the name of the shadow price is called the dual value. What value are you bringing to the marketplace by increasing your hours? And this is true in some companies because in some companies, even if people start increasing the hours of labor, then everybody start falling sick. The increment in the hours is not helping the company in any way. People are overstressed. The shadow price is zero. It doesn't matter what they do. And this is a reality. So sometimes when a very experienced person dies in the company, then so many things are spoiled. So let me ask you some questions. And you want to write this down just to get a sense of the shadow. So the shadow price is the marginal value of an extra unit of a resource. The marginal value, the extra value of an extra unit of a resource. And it is always about a right-hand side. You know, how much objective function value is affected, is changing. Is it changing? Whether it's increasing or decreasing? If you should increase the right-hand side of the constraint by a unit. Of course, when you're increasing the right-hand side of that particular unit's resource, you are holding the other resources constant. But even if you remove, please note this, even if you increase the right-hand side of the constraint by whatever unit, the fact that it's going to improve the profit because the shadow price is positive, it doesn't mean that because of that, you increase the right-hand side. Ah. For example, the person is supposed to work 40 hours a week. You can't say that if I increase the labor hours, profit is going to increase by 16. So because of that, you're increasing the hours of work. You're increasing the hours. You can't. It's unacceptable. In reality, you break down the person. So there is a limit within which you can increase or decrease the resource. Note that down, we'll come back to that. There is a limit by which you can increase or decrease the right-hand side of the constraint. Let's take a typical example to understand and appreciate the shadow price. If you have a situation, if management, note that down, if management can raise extra resources, they have a choice to want to increase one of the resources. Which one will be of most value to them in this context and why? Which one will be of most value to them and why? Don't guess. Don't guess. Which one? Raymond. Let me go to Raymond. No, labor. Why? Reason being, the shadow price is higher compared to that of milk. Perfect. That's it. Guys, it's labor. But do you think that they can raise labor by more than... Okay, we'll come back to that. Okay. Do you think they can raise labor by more than... I was going to say by more than 45? But I'll come back to that. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Philip, what would you have said? Would I have been able to raise labor by more than 45? No, we'll come back to that. We'll come back. Okay. So, so that's the first one. Now let's give you another scenario. The next question. Write this down. What if management can raise profit? What if management can raise profit by either increasing labor hours by 20. They can raise profit by either increasing labor hours by 20 or gallons of milk by 40. 
one of them. They can either erase the hours of labor by 40, by 20, or gallons of milk by 40. Write it down. Which should they choose? Which should they choose? You are going to explain to me instead of just multiplying and adding things. Which should they choose? And is that sensible? Is that sensible? Let's go to, yeah, who can tell us something? Nathaniel. Let's go to Nathaniel. So please, uh, I think that man, man meant to opt for labor because if uh, uh, the increased labor by, by 20 hours, I think they will get... Uh, you think? Did you say you think? Yeah, so the, the profit will increase by 320. But if they increase not by 40, uh, the... the, the the milk will also increase by 240. What will increase by 240? The profit for milk will increase by 240. There's no, there's nothing called profit for milk. The profit for fine chocolate will increase by. No, there's nothing called profit for fine chocolate. 240. Or... No, you are mixing them. Let's go to Bright. Let Bright help you. Okay, uh, sir, I'll uh, uh, I'll go labor because uh, when you look at the shadow price of labor, a sixteen, and then if they increase uh, labor by two hours, when you multiply, you have three twenty. Uh, the the profit from uh from choosing labor will be three twenty, and then that of milk will be two forty. So it makes economic sense to go for labor because it gives you more profit than when you, you choose the increment in milk. Super. I like that. So which one did we increase? It's right-hand side. We increase the right-hand side of milk by more. 40. We increase the right-hand side of labor by less. You know, by more, I mean, by a little less than that of the 40. That one was increased by 20. So somebody might say that, ah, but I increased the gallons of milk by a lot, 40 gallons. And that's for the labor, I just did it by 20. So because I've increased the gallons by more, I'm expecting that the gallons will give us more profit than that of the labor, but no. The thing is that labor has got more power than the gallons. So let me give you a typical example. You're a company, you want to send some people to go and discuss some things with your partners in Dubai. You can either send the cleaner, two cleaners, to go to Dubai and do that meeting, or you can send the executive director and his assistant to go and do that meeting. There are still two people that you can send, okay? But then the value the executive director and his assistant are bringing to the marketplace, that's a shadow price. The value you bring to the marketplace, that is what is going to reward the company. And so you always check the shadow price. It makes, I like the way the, the guy used, he says it makes economic sense to do that, okay? Now, let's go to the next thing, and that is known as the sensitivity range. Note it down. What is a sensitivity range? The sensitivity range tells you the lower bound and the upper bound within which to change the objective coefficient or the constraint, the right-hand side constraint. The sensitivity range is a lower bound or the upper bound within which to alter the objective coefficient or the right hand side of the constraint.
So we are going to calculate the sensitivity range. And how do you calculate the sensitivity range? Please look on the screen. The sensitivity range is given by lower bound, okay, less than or equal to the sensitivity range for that particular product. Okay, so let's say the product is going to be yogurt or choco, whichever one. And then that should also be less than or equal to the upper bound, which is U. So this is what we mean by the sensitivity range. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to calculate the sensitivity range for Yugo. And then I will let each one of you calculate the sensitivity range for the others. Remember, we have sensitivity range for the variable cells, and we also have sensitivity range for the constraint cells. Let's start with the labor, the Yugo. Miriam Chidi. You have a question. Yes, sir. Um, sir, please, I'd like for you to explain the difference between um, the shadow price and the sensitivity range. Oh. How different are they from each other? They're not even comparable. You see, when you raise the available resources, the right hand side of the constraint. By how much you will raise it or reduce it will be determined by the sensitivity range. That's it. So you are only raising that, but then it will be determined by the sensitivity range, but the shadow price is going to tell you the effect of that change you did. So the shadow price tells you the effect of when you do something to the available resource. Then the sensitivity range tells you not the effect, but then what, by how much or what you can do to that available resource. What can you do? I mean, to what extent can you touch available resource? That's what the sensitivity range is telling you. To what extent, to what extent can you touch that right hand side of the constraint? To what extent? But then the, the, the shadow price is telling you that if you touch it, what would be the effect on profit? Okay, I hope you get it. And that is that's the main difference. Um, in both case, you are touching the available resource, the right hand side of the constraint. But how much, how far can you touch it? That's what the sensitivity range is telling you. And then what will be the effect of touching it? That is what the shadow price is telling you. Okay. So let's calculate the, the lower bound. Now, how do you calculate the lower bound? The lower bound for the variable cells, okay? The lower bound is calculated as the objective coefficient plus the objective coefficient minus the allowable decrease. That's how you do it. Then less than or equal to the sensitivity range for that particular product. Then less than or equal to the objective coefficient plus the allowable increase. So this is how you calculate it. So the objective coefficient minus that. So if you take the the first one for Yugo, the sensitivity range is going to be 40 minus allowable decrease, which is 15. So that is going to be 25. So it's going to be 25. That will be the lower bound, okay, less or equal to the sensitivity range for Yugo. This time I know the actual value. Then less or equal to, then, the upper bound is 40 plus 26.67, which is going to be 66.67. So this is how I have calculated the sensitivity range for Yugo. Okay, what does this mean? That's key. What does this mean? Now, first of all, you can see that it comes from the coefficient. What is a coefficient? The coefficient is per unit profit for yoga. So that 40, it can be increased or decreased. 
that per unit profit can go up or come down. By how much? How much higher can it go? It can go all the way up to 66.67, finished. And it can come all the way down to 25, finish. As long as, and this is a very important point I'm about to say, as long as this coefficient is within the sensitivity range, the optimal solution, the optimal solution, the optimal solution is the 24 and eight, that optimal solution, which is a 24 and the eight will never change. As long as the coefficient is within the sensitivity range, the optimal solution will not change. As long as it's within, the optimal solution will not change. The moment it goes outside the sensitivity range, the optimal solution will change. That's the first point. When it comes to the sensitivity range for the coefficient, what about a profit? As for the profit, it will always change. As for the profit, it will always change. So when I say as for the profit, it will always change. What I mean is that even if it is within the sensitivity range, so let's say that you increase the 40, it gets to 50. It's not up to 66 yet it is still within the sensitivity range. So the optimal solution of 24 and eight will not change. That is true. However, the profit will change. That's what we are saying. So the profit is going to change no matter what, as long as you touch the sensitivity range, that profit will change. And again, if you like, we can go back to the sheet and then double check it, okay? The values we had were 40 here, and then there were 50 here. So if we go to the 40 and we decide that we're going to increase the 40 to 50, according to the sensitivity range, it should not change. Okay. The optimal values of 24 and 8 should remain the same. Let's go and run it and see. So you go to your data tab, you go to your, come on, your solver, and we're going to just solve again. Okay. And just what happens? Let's create a new sensitivity range number five. And this is sensitivity range number five. You can see that the optimal solution of 24 and eight are still what it is. Okay. However, the profit will change. Okay, what is the profit? So let's go back to the thing and check the profit. The profit is eight uh, 20, 1006. But it was 1360. The profit has changed now. So the sensitivity range is indicating that for the coefficient, as long as the coefficient is within the band, the optimal solution won't change, but profit will change. Note it down. You can find the sensitivity range for choco as well. But I want you to find the sensitivity range for labor. Okay. I want you to find the sensitivity range for labor. And let's see. Let's do the sensitivity range for labor. Tell me who can raise a hand and tell me the values of the sensitivity range for labor. The values of the sensitivity range for labor. Who has it? The values of the sensitivity range for labor. Okay, Nathaniel. Natalia, you've been contributing a lot in class. These are the names I don't forget. I don't forget at all. Yeah. Okay. So, so please, to calculate for the sensitivity of labor, uh, I'll, I'll have my uh, logistic coefficient minus the allowable decrease representing the, the, the lower bound of labor. Then, Less than, or equal, less than the sensitivity range for labor. Oh, and just tell me the lower and upper values. Okay, so my lower value would be 40 minus 10, which would be 30. 
and the upper value will be 40 plus 40, giving me 80. So at the end of the day, I will get a sensitivity rate for labor as 30 and 80. Good. Good. 30 and 80. Ah, thank you. Thank you. That's that's really good. So that sensitivity range, by the way, let me just change this to where it was before. This was the 80. Well, that sensitivity range that you just mentioned, which if I go back here, this is it. What does that mean? Remember when we're dealing with the coefficient, but this time we are dealing with the right hand side. And even if that's a point you got in the notes, for the right hand side, even if the sensitivity range, even if the right hand side is increased or decreased, the optimal solution together with the profit will both change. Even if you are within the sensitivity range, the optimal solution will still change. The profit will still change for the right hand side of the constraint. Even if you are within. So let's say that we are talking about a 40, okay? And you just told us that the sensitivity range is, what was it? The values would be what? 30 and 80, is that it? Let me just unmute you so that all of you can talk. Yeah, it will be 40 and 80. Is that, is that correct? Who, who asks? You can unmute yourself. 30 and 80. Okay, so that, that range means that you can increase this 40 all the way no more than 30, no more than 80. So if you increase this thing to 60, okay, it's still within, but I'm saying that even if it's within, the optimal solution will change, unlike that of the coefficient. So I can go here, change this value to 60 right now, okay, and go and run the thing again. Watch it, run this and generate a new sensitivity report. Let's call it a number. Today we are changing the thing, so. Sensitivity report six, okay, so this is six. You can see that the optimal solution has changed, okay? But if it was a coefficient, the optimal solution won't change. So what I'm saying is that for the, and this is important, for the right-hand side, no matter what you do with it, whether you increase it or decrease it, even if it's within the sensitivity range, both the optimal and profit will change. Okay. What about the shadow price? What will happen to the shadow price? Now you can see that the shadow price won't change as long as it's within the sensitivity range. So look at it here. The shadow price is still 16 and six, even though the right-hand side has been increased to 60. What if I increase it past? the 60, I mean, past the 80, which is a limit. Let's go to 81 and watch what happens to the shadow price. So the shadow price only changes when you are out of the band. Remember, as for the optimal solution and the profit, you have consistently said that they will change, okay? So we now create a new one. Let's see what happens to the new shadow price with sensitivity report. You can see that the shadow price now is zero. Okay, why? Because we have exceeded the right answer. And of course, the optimal values, the final values have changed, as you can see there. That we know already, we know the profit will change, but the shadow price is only affected when you exceed the sensitivity range. Guys, keep this in your mind. It's critical. It is critical. It is critical. All right, let's go to the last two points, and then we are done for today. The first point, let me check you small. Um, if I actually ask you that, um, okay, let me ask you this. As long as any change in the constraint is within the sensitivity range, what happens? You can tell me. As long as any change in the constraint, the right-hand side of the constraint, is within the sensitivity range, what happens? What happens? As long as any change is within GD, what happens? And for the right hand side, the optimal value 
I'm sorry, your line is breaking. Can't hear you. within the sensitivity range. Sorry, sorry, we can't hear you at all. Your line is breaking. Let me go to Michael Barton. All right. So, so as long as we are with sensitivity range, when we change the right hand side, this optimal solution will change. The maximum profit will change, but the shadow price will be the same. Perfect. Done. That's it. Excellent. You are the people who listen to me. Okay. Let me ask you another question. In this whole program of Farmer Ghana Limited, were there any wastages? Who can answer that? Were there any wastages in this Farmer Ghana Limited? Looking at the final results that we had and everything. Was there any wastages? Yeah. Any wastages? No, because there were zero slugs. Because the left hand side of the resources were the same as the right hand side of the resource. Were there any leftovers? Were there any leftovers? Were there any leftovers in this farm of Ghana Limited? Miriam. Miriam. So which of us? There are about three of us. <laughs> I like that. So you answer. It seems you brought yourself answer. Are there any leftovers? Are there any slugs? No, there are no slugs. Okay, now my last one. If the manager, and this is very important, okay, let me hold on to this. Okay, let me hold on to this. Now think, and, and then again, I pray this thing doesn't go off. I just hope. Now right, to go off, to go off, so let me just continue. Now let's assume, and I want you to document this. So let's assume that fine milk, the fine yogo was rather zero instead of 24. Note it down, okay, check here. Let me go to the first sensitivity report. Let's assume that it was rather zero instead of 24. And I'm talking about this. It was zero here instead of 24. And then the reduced cost is negative five. Okay. I'm talking about this. Let me just go here. This one. Uh -huh. Let's say the situation is rather here. Zero with a negative five reduced cost. Okay. And then the the choco was 20 instead of the eight with a zero reduced cost. But then the per unit profit for choco is 90, as you can see here. So basically what I'm doing is I'm talking about every information that you see in this yellow session. Suppose this was the case. This was a result you had. My question is, by how much would the profit contribution of Yogo has to increase before it will be profitable to produce it? Who can tell me that answer? By how much would the profit contribution of Fanyugo? Who can tell me currently the profit contribution of Fanyugo? In this yellow section, what is the profit contribution of Fanyugo now? No, 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 no system. What is the profit contribution of Fanyugo? Um, Nathaniel. Yes, the profit. Contribution for fine yogo is 40. Okay, so my question now is that by how much would this 40 has to increase? By how much should it increase before it will be profitable to produce fine yogo? Because right now, as it stands, it's not profitable to produce fine yogo. And the reason is because its profit contribution of 40 is not good. That is why the management is not willing to produce anything. By how much do you think the profit will have to go? For it to be producible now, who can tell me? Evelyn. Five. Evelyn. By five. No. But my question is that, okay, by five, to what? To what? Evelyn, to what? She's lost again. 
Yes. Emily, increase your volume. Come closer to your microphone. Come closer to your microphone. I think you're using a headset or you are not using a headset, something. So I can't hear you. Okay, she's not gone. Let's go to the next person. Some more. Yeah, so please, uh, you have to, uh, because the reduced cost is already at negative five, and then the allowance increase also at five, which means that, as we've just seen from your from the table, the final value will be zero, so which means there will not be any profit. So if you want to increase it, then which means that we have to do it by five or by by six, then we can be able to produce. Uh, so we're get a that's my question. Sorry. We are increasing it to what value? To what value? To six. Okay, I think. Or more. Still, it's still not getting it. To what value, Frederick? We are increasing it to what value? We are increasing it to um 45. Exactly. That is a minimum. Okay. We are increasing it to 45 or more. That is what we are doing. So you got to know the difference between two and buy. By five means to 45. Okay. By six means to 46. So look at the difference. Okay. So basically, these are some of the questions that you got to be able to find ways to address them in that regard. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of the entire caboodle. What an evening it's been, what a time it's been, what a joy, what a joyful joy it has been today to have all of you in the middle of the thick forest along the Route 